The Métis are a distinct indigenous people. Métis communities in Ontario emerged along waterways and fur trade routes before Canada was a country. These historic Métis communities, which persist to the present day, develop their own customs, traditions, and identities that are rooted in kinship, relationship to the land, and a distinctive culture and way of life. It's like the end of a period of hiding and the beginning of a whole new period of we're not going to bow our heads anymore, we're not going to walk around ashamed anymore. From the time European fur traders began traveling from Montreal into the Great Lakes region, in the mid-17th century to the beginning of the 19th century, over 50 Métis communities had formed around fur trade posts and forts in this area. Sault Ste. Marie was one of the oldest Métis settlements, and certainly the most important. Most Métis worked in occupations supporting the fur trade. By 1850, the HBC's labor force in the Lake Huron, Lake Superior, and Sault Ste. Marie districts was about 70% Métis. Both First Nations and Euro-Canadians recognized the Sault Ste. Marie Métis as being a distinct cultural group of people. They were visually, culturally, and ethnically distinct. Despite this, the Métis community at Sault Ste. Marie has endured a centuries-long battle against the dispossession of traditional Métis lands and to have their legal rights as a distinct Indigenous people respected. One example of this is the Powley case. Father and son Steve and Roddy Powley embodied these truths. They enjoyed hunting together, securing food for their family. On October 22nd in 1993, my husband Steve Powley and my son Rod went out in the morning to go moose hunting like they usually do. They were out harvesting for the winter. Because he didn't have a government tag at the time, my husband took a piece of paper and wrote his name the time the moose were, was shot. And he uh, put his address and information harvesting for the winter and they, the M&R come and took the moose. They come back about a week later and then charge them both of the hunting without a, a government license. You know, at first he wasn't going to fight it, but after thinking about what was happening and, you know, and then you start thinking, you have the right to, as a Métis, you have the right under Section 35. On September 19, 2003, almost 10 years after they tagged their fateful moose, the Paulis and the Métis Nation won. In a unanimous judgment, the Supreme Court of Canada determined that the Paulis, as members of the Sault Ste. Marie Métis community, could exercise a Métis right to hunt that is protected under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. That moment of realization right that we that that what steve did and what roddy did and what the community did to support them and what the maintenance nation of ontario did to support them was another one of those moments in time where our our people had stood up for what was right had stood up to defend what was rightfully ours right that's what happens in micah bay micah bay is just over 100 kilometers north of sault saint marie between 1845 and 1850 the government of the province of Canada awarded land, approximately three kilometers by eight kilometers, along the lakeshore in the upper Great Lakes to several non-Indigenous groups. One of these sections of land included the Ojibwe and Métis settlement at Garden River. In 1849, it was the site of illegal copper mining that contravened the legislation that the British Crown had established. That legislation was meant to protect Indigenous communities and stated that no land was to be used until treaties were signed. A small group of Métis and First Nations set sail to confront this illegal mining. They wanted to send a message that without treaty, the province of Canada had no right or jurisdiction to issue mining permits and that those who came to exploit the region's resources were trespassing on their land. 
In response, the government sent a military force of 100 soldiers to stop the perceived Indian uprising. Captain A.P. Paston Cooper, the officer leading the soldiers sent to Micah Bay to stop the lawless self-assertion of the Indians, later published his impressions of the mission. The pretext for this outrage, I must say I think it a sound one, was that the company had the liberty of squatting on the happy hunting grounds of the Chippewas without the necessary preliminary of paying for the privilege. Despite his apparent questioning of the government's reaction to send troops, Paston Cooper did indicate that the men were excited to go and return to their city covered with glory and scalps. Many of the Métis and First Nation leaders involved were arrested. However, they were released when Chief Justice John B. Robinson determined that the arrests were illegal. The casualty-free confrontation forced the white miners out of Micah Bay and forced the Governor General to negotiate agreements with indigenous communities along the shores of Lake Huron and Lake Superior. This shrewd act of resistance paved the way for the Robinson Treaty, which was signed less than a year later in 1850. There's a period from 1850 to about 1870 where even after the treaty was signed and even after the, the river lots, most of the river lots had been lost uh, through um, a very similar type system to what happened in Manitoba. We were, we were told that we would have the right to buy back our, our own land, but without the means or the resources to do so. These river lots were the long, narrow waterfront lots where the Métis settled in the early 1800s. They were documented by Alexander Vidal, a surveyor who traveled through Sault Ste. Marie in 1846 and produced the Vidal survey. At that time, the Métis had almost exclusive occupancy of what is the present-day waterfront of Sault Ste. Marie. The Métis that lived together here in Sault Ste. Marie, we know the, the Métis farms were along the river, so the Métis families were close together. They stayed together. Uh, they, uh, you know, they participated. They danced together. They sang together. They partied together. They... Uh, you know, it had very close kinship and family relationship be between those groups uh, in the Sault Ste. Marie area here. But as settlers began to encroach on Sault Ste. Marie, issues were raised surrounding legal title to these lots. The government of the province of Canada saw the Métis as squatters, who, as French Catholics, also posed a threat to the spread of English Protestantism. The settlers wanted exclusive control over the land and resources. The Métis wanted to keep their lands that they called home. After the Treaty of 1850, they just came in and took the land because we didn't have a paper from the government saying we owned it. Despite repeated attempts to have their rights recognized, the Métis were excluded from the eventual treaty, and in response, they created the 1850 Sault Ste. Marie Petition. This document requested that as people born on this land, who had cultivated and developed the lands, and who had fought with the British to protect them during the War of 1812, they should be permitted to keep their lands under the terms of the Robinson Treaties. The Métis had inherited the land from their First Nations mothers, or purchased the land from other Métis, or First Nations people, or family members had been awarded land grants for service in the War of 1812. The chiefs of the Ojibwe's addressed a memorial to the Earl of Elgin, Governor General of the Province of Canada, in September 1850, mentioning their disapproval in charging the Métis for their own land, at a price greater than the amount the government paid for the land in the first place. We stand up and, and just quite simply say, this is what's right and we are going to defend it. It's like so many moments in Métis history where, where one or two individuals take a stand on behalf of the people. The 1850 Métis petition and memorial of the Ojibwe chiefs were ultimately rejected and ignored. The government of the province of Canada did not negotiate with the Métis. They did not offer money or new lands to the Métis in exchange for their homelands. In February 1852, the Sault Ste. Marie Métis were not given recognition of land ownership but instead were told they would be allowed to purchase land grants of 50 acres on which they lived 
for one shilling per acre. During the following years, many Métis were pushed off the lands they were so strongly connected to. In 1853, as a result of the involvement in the Mica Bay incident of Euro-Canadian lawyer and mineral speculator Alan MacDonnell, the Canadian government passed a law. This law made it a crime for anyone to encourage or motivate First Nation and Métis people to what they called disturb the peace. This made it difficult for Métis and First Nations people to get help when there were injustices. But the Métis community persisted and continues to assert their rights. Today, downtown Sault Ste. Marie sits on historic Métis traditional lands. We always knew. We were Métis and we had deep roots in this area. We've been really actively uh, engaged in rebuilding the Métis Nation and rebuilding our communities and rebuilding those cultural and artistic practices that, uh, that really make up uh, who we are. One of the things that we're so well known for, and you know, in fact, like known by other, other Indigenous peoples uh, historically, was as the floral beadwork people. It's a really important part of our, our identity, but I think it's also a really important part of our, our history. Métis means, uh, you know, being part of the land. Métis, uh, it's a spiritual feeling when you're out on the land. Métis is family. Uh, Métis is a way of life. It's, it's pa we pass it on to our children and make sure, we want to make sure that that's passed on to their children. The Pauli case, the Mica Bay incident, and its resulting Robinson Treaty, and the Riverlot land rights battle are profound examples of the struggle to protect traditional Métis lands and assert Métis rights. And the advancement of these rights all reaffirm the distinct Métis identity and help to shape contemporary Métis lives. <laughs>